Do a second video here on section 7.5. Uh, so now we're just going to be applying some of those ideas from trapezoids and kites. So without further ado, let's jump into example number one. It says to show that the quadrilateral with vertices Q, R, S, and T, let me mark those real fast. We got 0, 3, we've got 0, 6, we've got negative 6, 0, and we have negative 3, 0. So show that it is a trapezoid. And then separately, it says to decide whether the trapezoid is isosceles, okay? Now just looking this over, I know a lot of students would just say, yeah, it looks like a, like a trapezoid, it must be a trapezoid. We need to actually work on how we show this, okay? What pro properties, what processes go into it, okay? Well, as we talked about before, we said that any trapezoid is really just any quadrilateral with exactly one pair of parallel sides in the first video we had talked about, okay? So let's look at these opposite sides and double check which we think might be parallel, okay? We got RS and QT. They seem to be going the same direction, so maybe those two. We've got ST, which is horizontal, and RQ, which is vertical, on the axes, and that would actually mean that they would eventually intersect if I continued them at the origin, 0, 0. So it's definitely not those two, okay? So let's really focus on RS and QT. If I want to show that this is a trapezoid, I know a lot of students just go, okay, I'll put the arrows, and now I've shown it. No, you just marked that those opposite sides were parallel without actually showing that they were parallel, okay? So let's think about this. With regard to parallel lines or parallel segments, what is required? Well, anytime I'm talking about parallel lines, we're talking about the, the tilt being the same, right? And if we're going to focus on the tilt, I hope another concept comes to mind known as the slope, okay? So let's quickly break down the slope of each of these segments and see what we find. From S to R, I'm going to find my rise. I'm going to find my run, okay? It's an easy visual, so I think the visual rise over run approach is kind of an easier route. So up six, uh, right six, and you'll notice, obviously, rise over run is going to be the slope of SR is equal to one, okay? Just using a subscript to denote which slope I just found, okay? Um, next up, let's try the same thing from T to Q. So I follow that up three units, I follow it over three units, once again, that's up is a positive, right is a positive, and therefore we get positive 3 over 3, or, well, 1 again, okay? So what has this shown us? It's shown us that the slopes are the same, and I hope we all recall that parallel slopes are always the same. So this would tell us that segment SR is parallel to segment TQ, therefore QRST is a trapezoid. Okay, pretty straightforward. Now here's the next piece. It says to decide whether the trapezoid is isosceles. Well, isosceles trapezoids always have legs, not bases, but legs that are congruent, okay? Actually, if the bases were congruent, then that's going to create a second set of parallel sides, and that goes back to work with a parallelogram, okay? So if I'm going to show that it's isosceles, I want to just find the length of ST in RQ. Well, you'll notice these are lined up on verticals and horizontals, and so all I've got to do is count across. If they were on a diagonal, I would have to use either the Pythagorean theorem or the, uh, you know, the coordinate geometry version of that known as the distance formula, right? That's how you, how you go about finding those diagonal distances. So let's just count across from S to T, one, two, three, three units across, R to Q, one, two, three. And so obviously, this is an isosceles trapezoid. I'm just going to abbreviate it. Okay, isosceles, trapezoid. All right, so now let's apply some of the other topics we had looked at just last video. Um, we're going to go about finding some segment lengths within trapezoids. Really, all three of these have to do with that when a mid segment is drawn. Well, how do I know this is a mid segment? Well, it's pretty simple, really. You've got your bases, which are parallel, and that would, of course, make these the legs. C clearly bisects this leg. We've got two notches and two notches. D bisects that leg, one notch and one notch. So those are midpoints. And when I connect them, I, of course, make my mid segment, okay? 
Now they already gave you one of the properties. We know the bases are parallel to the mid-segment. But the second property we, we had talked about was that the mid-segment is always the average of the bases, okay? It is the number, like if you were to line these up on a number line, 12 and 36, it's the number perfectly in the middle of 12 and 36. It's their average, right? Well, so if I've got 12 and 36 and I want to average them, that seems pretty straightforward. We add them up, we divide by 2, and we get 48 over 2, or 24 units. So that is length CD. Now, before we move on, I really want to continue to build your number sense here. Is that a reasonable answer? Well, obviously, it's less than 36. It's greater than 12. But is it the right answer? Let's think about that. 12 is how many units less than 24? Well, that would be 12 units less, right? 36 is how many units more than 24? Also, 12 units more. So hopefully it makes sense when we think about this as not just being a number between the two, but truly in the middle of them, okay? All right, let's go on to part B here. Well, all of a sudden, the setup changes somewhat, okay? <clears throat> and there are a couple different ways to, to approach this problem. I would like you to try this on your own and then unpause the video and see if your approach matches one of the two that I present, okay? Pause the video and come on back to it. All right, so hopefully you found a pretty uh, reasonable approach here. We know, first of all, that the mid-segment is the average of the other two. Now, I don't have a variable representing this length, so we could introduce one maybe like x. Or if you just wanted to call it cd, you could go ahead and call it cd. That's okay too. Now, because the mid-segment is 1.8 units long, I set that equal to the sum of the bases divided by 2, or x plus 0.6 divided by 2. Now, this may look a little convoluted, but it's really just a two-step equation to isolate your variable, right? The first step, let's get rid of this division by 2. We will multiply both sides by 2. I get 3.6 equals x plus 0.6. And the second step, let's go ahead and subtract off the 0.6, subtract it over to get 3 equals x, okay? So like I said, that's one solid approach you could have taken. This is more of a mental math approach. Now, we just talked about how to tell if our answer was sensible over here. And you may have noticed that, again, we subtracted 12, we added 12 to that value of 24, and that, of course, was how we double-checked our answer. So let's try that with 1.8 and 0 0.6. 0 0.6 is 1.2 less than uh, 1.8. Obviously, if I subtract those, we can see that quite quickly. So what if instead of subtracting it, I were to add it? 1.8 plus 1.2 gives me 3.0, 3. So in either case, it did in fact work out just fine, okay? A couple different approaches, and it's really your call as to how to do that. Now that you've got a hang, uh, you know, the, the hang of the, the process, I'd like you guys to try whatever method you would like for example number three. Now, I would recommend this first because obviously we don't have any known values, okay? I would recommend averaging your values. So pause the video, give it a shot, see how it goes. All right, so hopefully you ended up with x equals 9. We're going to talk about how to actually check that in a second. Let's talk about our setup. We know our mid-segment here is 3x minus 2, and that is the average. So I'm going to set it on one side of my equation. This is my answer, my average, just like 24 was earlier. It was on the other side of my average process, okay? So I'm going to set this equal to the sum of the bases. That's x plus 11 and 3x plus 3. Sum them, so we add them up. And then, of course, we divide by 2. There are two segments. That's how we average. So x plus 3x is 4x. 11 plus 3 is 14. I get 3x minus 2 is equal to 4x plus 14 all over 2. Well, now what? Well, 2 goes nicely into both of these. So instead of doubling both sides, instead of multiplying that across, we can just divide it in. That's maybe the easier approach. So now we're going to get 3x minus 2 equals 2x plus 7. Let's now subtract the 2x over to get x minus 2 equals 7. And I'll just add the 2 over. So there we go. Now, when we started this, I said we'll talk about a way to check it. Here's why. If I got x equals 5 instead here, I wouldn't know if that's right or wrong. If 
five seems reasonable, nine seems, re seems reasonable. It's just hard to know. So this is where a little bit of mental math, or you could feel free to work it out on paper, uh, can really go a long way to double check in your work. If x is nine, let's look these values over. Nine plus 11 is 20. Three times nine is 27. 27 minus two is 25, right? So 25 minus five is 20. 25 plus five should be my other answer, 30. Let's try it. Nine times three is 27. 27 plus three, you got it. We got 30, okay? So like I said, we're trying to build that number sense along with the process of how we actually solve these. All right, next page here. So we're going to go about finding the measure of these angles. Find the measure of angle K, find the measure of angle L. Hmm. Let's categorize part A first. So obviously it's a trapezoid, but it goes a little bit farther than that. We know that the legs are congruent, right? Well, because the legs are congruent, that makes this an isosceles trapezoid. And not only do the four angles add up to 360, and our consecutive angles on each leg, 23 and J, or L and K, not only will those have to add up to 180, after all, they're consecutive interior angles, like we talked about last semester. This angle with that angle, you got parallel lines, right? We talked about how these add up to 180. But on top of that, we have this other idea, known as the base angles of an isosceles trapezoid. They tell us that the angles located on one of the bases, in this case, M and L, or the other base, J and K, are automatically congruent, okay? So if I use that idea here, I can bring 23 straight over for angle L. So 23 degrees. We got our first one taken care of. Measure of angle L is equal to 23 degrees. Now, there are a couple different approaches here for K. So I'd like you to try that one and see if you can, can uh, calculate your answer, okay? Pause the video, see how it goes. All right, so one of the fastest approaches is just to say, well, L and K are those consecutive interior angles, same side interior. So I know that they add up to 180. 180 minus 23 is 157, right? Yeah, carry a little bit, there's your seven, there's your five, there's your one, okay? That is correct, but there's another approach. If I know 23 and 23, that's 46 of my total of 360. If I subtract that, I'm going to get 314 degrees, and I know that's evenly split between these two. What do you think half of 314 is? 157, okay? So like I said, you do have a couple different approaches, and it kind of comes down to how you see the problem. Next up, we've got a kite, and we're looking for angles K and L. So once again, see if you can do this problem, and then double check your work. All right, so we've got 130, we've got 90, I'm looking for L and K. Let me remind you that with all kites, you could draw this diagonal from those opposite angles that are between your congruent sides. So the, the angle between the double notches, the angle between the single notches, and you can actually set up a triangle and another triangle that are congruent by side, side, side. All I'm using is the reflexive property here to say it's congruent to itself, okay? Well, automatically, that tells me that all the angles from this triangle have to match an angle in this triangle. And one of those is going to be angle L and angle K. They're between corresponding sides, after all. So when I start to break this down, and I've got 90 and 130, that's 220 degrees. Well, these have to be congruent, don't they? So if I know that all four of them together add up to 360, let's find what's left for L and K. You should get 140 degrees left, and if I divide that by two, I'll get each of these remaining angles. So 70 degrees here, 70 degrees there, okay? Pretty straightforward. Finally, um, we're gonna do this last one together. <clears throat> so keep in mind, this is a kite, and I wanna remind you of some of those properties, okay? We just talked about how this diagonal was shared with the top triangle and the bottom triangle there. And that proved that the top triangle was congruent to the bottom triangle. It also matches up some angles, specifically HGJ and FGJ. Okay, those are congruent. Now, if I look just at these small triangles on the left, you'll notice they share side length GJ. I'm going to put two notches. 
And by side, angle, side, I've now proven triangle congruence. That means everything matches, including the side across from the angle with one arc in each. So what that tells me is that 9 equals 1 tenth x minus 1. Pretty basic setup. But how we got there, that's the real kind of magic of the geometry behind it, OK? So 9 is equal to 1 tenth x minus 1. Let's go ahead and add the 1 over. We get 10 equals 1 tenth of x. And this is where a lot of people start to get stumped. They go, wait a second, it's a fraction. I'm multiplying. Keep in mind, we don't uh, divide by fractions. We multiply by their reciprocals. Some of you may have heard that, that phrase, keep it, switch it, flip it. I'm just going to refer to it as multiplying by the reciprocal. Okay? So let's multiply both sides of the equation by the flip version, the reciprocal, of 10 over 1. Well, 10 times 1 tenth, of course, reduces to 1. So I'm left with 1x over here. And 10 times 10, of course, is 100. Now, when I look at that, that seems like a ridiculously large value, given that this was only 9 units long, right? Keep in mind, your variable is not your segment length, OK? 1 tenth of 10, it, I'm sorry, 1 tenth of 100 is 10, and 10 minus 1 is 9. So we do, in fact, get the same distance across. All right, hopefully you guys found this video helpful. If you have any additional questions, please let me know. I'll see you.